everyone and welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast. My name's Amelia and I'm joined today by Caitlin Moore and Peter Fobian. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, I am a writer and editor for Anime Feminist as well as running my own blog. I have a heroin problem. Heroin with an E. Very important. Mm -hmm. I am Peter Fobian. I'm an Associates Features Editor at Crunchyroll and a contributor and editor for Anime Feminist. And today we're going to talk about conventions as a concept. I am still horrendously jet lagged. Just got back from a three week geek tour extravaganda of the United States of America, where I attended three cons with anime feminist writers at each convention. So I went to Otacon in Washington DC for the first time this year. And we had most of the Anafem writing team there, which was fantastic. Um, and then I went to Anime Fest in Dallas with Caitlin the following weekend. And then the final weekend went to the very first ever Crunchyroll Expo, which Peter was at, but I barely saw him. Um, and <laughs> uh, Lauren was also there. And at Crunchyroll Expo, Lauren and I did our first Anime Feminist panel together. And we also hosted an Anime Feminist Mixer in collaboration with organization Woke Weeps. So we're just, we've just finished that. This is our first weekend since that, that Anafem tour ended. And we thought we'd look at the concept of conventions and how being a feminist affects how we use them and how we approach them and also what we'd like out of them that might be a bit different. So I'm going to hand over to Caitlin um, to <laughs> take us through some questions around this. So if you'd like to go ahead, Caitlin. All right, so... Um, I've been going to conventions for a really long time. Uh, my first anime expo, or my first convention was Anime Expo 2002 when I was 15 years old. So I've been going to cons oh for about, <laughs> yeah, for about <laughs> half my life. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, I went every year through high school and college. In college, I also went to Otakon as well. Um, and then I moved to Japan. I, they sort of stopped being an option for me for um, a few years. And then the last couple of years, um, I've been living in Seattle. I've been going to SakuraCon. Um, this was my second year picking Otakon back up. Um, so, you know, I've, I've sort of seen how the convention scene has... Um, shifted and evolved and how my personal experience of it has changed what have you guys been doing with cons in the past i'll let peter go first because the uk landscape is so different so uh geez i don't know how long i've been going to fanime expo but or fanime expo just fanime uh it's uh <laughs> it's uh been a really long time that was like the only con i went to for uh like maybe like seven or eight years um, I, oh, I know, I went to one called Animagic. I don't know if that's still going on. It was, like, in the middle of nowhere. I think it was one that tried to start up and really didn't go anywhere. It's totally still going, and I don't know about it, and I just insulted the convention, but, uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but then I went to Expo, I think this year was my third Expo. Um, and it's also the first one that I wasn't basically working a booth at, uh, for Crunchyroll. So, uh, then I went to some, like, uh, gaming conventions and stuff like that. So as far as, uh, anime is concerned, uh, it wasn't until, I think this year has probably been my most, um, active. I went to SakuraCon one year as well. Uh, that's an important again. convention. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, outside of fanime, I've mostly been doing, like, industry and press-related stuff. Um, so this was, like, my first year at Otakon and, um, kind of... Well, I guess also my first year, like, seriously actually working at convention, too. Not just a booth, but actually working with, like, convention ops. Because I was working with Crunchyroll at uh, Crunchyroll Expo. So, um, I think I've got a lot of different perspectives just from this year. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting sort of seeing how, like, different roles really per, uh, affect how you experience convention. Because... Um, I've really, I've only ever staffed a couple, but I've done press and I've done regular attendee and I've done panelist. Um, I've never done vendor or artist or anything, but like, they're totally different conventions. Um, like the experience yeah, is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. It absolutely. really is. I'd say press is the best one. 
I, yeah, having now experienced it, I would completely agree. The uh, UK landscape is very different. Like I said, we don't, I think the smallest con I went to of those three was probably about 10,000 people. Like we don't, we don't have conventions, anime conventions with 10,000 people in them. Um, that's, sure and that's not a particularly large convention. No, and we just don't have the infrastructure for it on two levels. We don't have the physical infrastructure, a building that can house a convention in a meaningful way, hosting that many people, plus surrounding accommodation options, plus the kind of transport options to get between venue and accommodation. We don't really have spaces like that that could house 10,000 plus. Um, and we also just as a as a UK anime community, my experience has been that it's much harder to kind of plug into. I mean, I run a fairly high fo profile website at this point. Um, I think we we learned while I was in the US that we have 25,000 unique visitors a month. I mean, that's that's pretty decent traffic for, for where we're at. And I have. I know very few UK anime fans off the back of that, very few. I think something like two, three percent of our readers are Brits. And as a Brit myself, I feel like I've kind of let the side down in a way. Um, so it's it's quite difficult to to find a way into that to that community. I'm not even sure there is a cohesive community. So I'm, I'm still kind of finding my feet there. I'm planning to attend more UK conventions from now on kind of under the anime feminist banner and see what kind of community I can build up. But at the moment, there aren't the obvious entry points that there are through Anna Twitter, which is largely American. So that's, it's it's quite a different, different landscape. So there's two kind of types of convention that I'm aware of, maybe three, 2.5. One is the uh, Comic Cons. We have MCM Comic Cons uh, throughout uh, the UK. I say that, I think we have them in England and Scotland, sorry, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and they are kind of omni-geek gatherings. So it's not just anime, but it is a convenient place for a lot of cosplayers to gather and to nerd out over kind of industry announcements and that kind of thing. So they're more like small scale comic cons? Yeah, and it's it's very much kind of a trade show almost. It is It is a place for exhibitors to set up and for fans to gather and meet their friends, but it's not a convention of the type that I've just come back from. So fan panels, not really such a thing. They do have stages and people do host events on them, but it's not the same atmosphere at all. Um, then we have the fan run conventions. And I went to, I think two or three of these back before I, I went to Japan for the first time. So I'd never been to Japan. I didn't identify as a feminist. Those are kind of my only uh, experiences of fan run cons to date and my experience I went to a couple I went to one with friends where I did the full weekend and had a lovely time um, but it was there with friends and I don't remember there being I don't remember there being guests at all there may well have been but I don't remember there being guests this must have been around 2005 2004 2005 and I remember there being lots of video rooms things like a karaoke room stuff like that. Um, so it was more about partaking in fan activity or act like Japan related activities with other anime fans. That that was kind of the point of it. Um, and then another time I just went on my own for a day. <laughs> and I just, I think I went to try and get stuff for my anime society. I was the secretary at the time and I wanted to get free stuff to give away uh, for like our recruitment drive at the beginning of the year. Ended up doing very well out of that. UK uh, exhibitors were very accommodating um and i met some really interesting people and as a result of that i actually met andrew partridge at that time he runs anime limited which is a big distribution name in the uk they uh this year distributed or they ran the cinema releases actually for a silent voice your name ordinal scale big cinema releases but they've been doing kind of specialist blu-ray editions of uh high profile shows like how we bebop for years um and andrew at that time was just kind of a uh, a standard marketing staffer back at Bees, which is the European division of Bandai, and we became friends. And as a result, I kind of helped him out on the Bandai, sorry, the Bees booth for a little while after that. So I've worked behind the stall then, but this is a long time ago. I mean, this is over 10 years ago. And my recent experiences have been much more Comic-Con and that's it. So going to the US and <laughs> experiencing what you guys have as standard that has been such an incredible experience and a real education, actually. Yeah, and you know, and US cons have, um, 
evolved a lot over the last few years as well. Um, you know, I mean, they've always sort of had the the same basic structure of like dealer's room, artist alley, fan panels, guest panels. But like, for example, Anime Expo is completely unrecognizable from when I first started going. Um, my first year it was in Long Beach Convention Center, which is a much, much smaller capacity con. Um, and they had guests, like they've always had really good guests from Japan, but they were way, way less emphasized. Um, you didn't have to pay extra to get into any events. Um, you know, they didn't have like the maid cafe or, you know, it was just, you know, it was... It wasn't small, like it was the biggest con in the country already when I started going, but like, um, it felt a lot less packed in, you know, and like, and you know, like I said, it's, it was always more industry driven than a lot of cons, but, um, you know, and part of that comes from how like anime fan culture has changed with the times, like, um, you know, you would, you would go to conventions, um, for the big announcements because this was the age of DSL. Things were not <laughs> as, even though there was the internet, things were not as instantaneously accessible. Um, so yeah, just like seeing all the ways that, um, it has changed. Um, and in a lot of ways, like there's a lot more mainstream acceptance from the public yeah. in general. I mentioned before that there are, I, I said three and actually maybe 2.5 cons in the UK. The third type is, we have something now called Hyper Japan, which I think now happens twice a year. And it's basically a convention for the fandom of Japanese-ness. <laughs> sounds a bit odd, but basically it's, I mean, it's obviously a place where anime fans gather, but basically it's for anyone who kind of has an interest in Japanese culture. So they have food stalls set up serving Japanese food. They have uh, something called the sake experience. So sake producers, you you go around this kind of course and take sips of sake as you go along from quality producers as they explain how the, the differences between the types of sake. They have, <clears throat> I think they still have a cosplay masquerade. They have a karaoke stage. They have people who produce kind of anime influenced things or manga influenced things. They have stalls there to sell them. And absolutely local Japanese-owned businesses are there with a presence. So it's it's not quite an anime convention, but of course anime fans make up a, a good proportion of the people there. And that's something that, as you say, that that's the mainstream acceptance that we see. It's not just anime fans of this tiny niche in a hotel in the middle of nowhere, which was what I experienced in 2004-2005. This is in kind of not quite central London, but it's in London. It's in a well-known a convention center right and it is something that normal people i'm making air quotes normal <laughs> people can go to and feel like they're having a cultural experience not just a geek experience not just a fandom experience so that's i think a good point to move into our next topic um so how does being a feminist or ally affect the congo experience well why don't you tell us about your experience first because i i only have this this kind of three weeks as an experience because I'd not been to a con as a feminist mm -hmm. before, if that makes sense. So yeah, I'm very keen to hear how your experience has changed. Um, it's so really... you'd probably be the best for this, Caitlin, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it's um, it's it's definitely affected um, what panels I attend, and also um, you know, I've got this real drive to. Um, do my own panels because of this because I have topics that I want to talk about and I have topics that I think are important to talk about um, like I've done like my uh, romance and abuse in shoujo manga panel um, every year for at every convention I've been going to for three years now um, so it's you know these you know being able to discuss these topics has really um affected my focus um and also the growth of um feminist aimed convention panels has really has really um changed a lot um In what way? there's you know um i mean i'm don't have like any old programming books from like my first year to anime expo or anything <laughs> in 
2003, like, people weren't doing feminist convention panels. Um, people weren't, you know, there might be, like, one or two, like, women in anime, uh, you know, uh, panels, but, like, it wasn't something that was in, at the forefront of people's minds. And now, like, mm -hmm. it's um, definitely, it is something that people take into consideration. Like, there's usually, like, you know, three or four panels at least um, about those sorts of topics at cons that I go to. Um, it's it's become a standard and it's become something that um, people are really invested in, um, which is really cool to see. Um, my, I think it was my first year at soccer con um, and I wrote a detailed report of this panel on um, heroin problem and on Tumblr, but like, it was like, um, the male gaze in or objectification in anime manga and video games and it was this dude who stood up and was just like oh dude men are being objectified like oh no um you know <laughs> look at, uh you know when you you have senran in senran kagura the girls are talking about the male like the harem lead as if um and calling him a battery because having sex with him charges their magical powers. That's a, that's them objectifying him. Um, oh so like the whole thing was really strange, and the room was just like so like like the room was full of women. Sakura Khan is a pretty progressive convention, um, but like just this room full of women were just getting like more and more agitated as the panel was going on. Um, like his, like his points were completely ridiculous. Like he called the male gaze a slippery concept and then talked about the female gaze in depth about like how free is the female gaze. Cause this was when free was really hot. Um, and just to be clear, these are absolutely great topics for a panel discussion, but they need to be led by somebody who understands them from all angles and can lead a constructive conversation around it and that doesn't sound like that's what was going on well, that's the thing like i i heard a lot of complaints in regards to uh feminist panels being put up mostly on twitter <laughs> oh you had some complaints one or two yeah yeah in, in pretty much all the conventions but i noticed there's never any panels uh for the other perspective and right. yeah, i don't know and they they seem to complain that there aren't panels either but I mean, I think a masculinity pa masculinity in anime panel would be really interesting. Nobody's yeah. submitting these panels, though. Well, <laughs> you know. It's like, guys, if you want to see this content, do what we did. Prepare a panel application, submit it, and then see how it does. Yeah. So <laughs> I have quite limited sympathy. But, like, the convention crowd in general is very su uh, pretty supportive of this sort of stuff. Um, you know, and there's... The whole cosplay is not consent movement, um, which that's fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sad that it had to that it had to come about because female cosplayers were getting really badly sexually harassed. Um, but that's another thing. Like that has I've seen that mentioned at every convention I've gone to in the last few years, um, and really clearly mm -hmm. and explicitly too. Like this isn't just a footnote somewhere. These are on banners multiple banners throughout the convention center so yeah I, I was so impressed by that and as you say that was at every convention that i went mm -hmm. to this month i think it's just become a new normal mm -hmm. and that's what we need we need this stuff to be just ingrained in the convention experience yeah they were very prominent i this is the first year like uh, it was unmistakable and at every single convention i noticed it at fanime expo otakon uh and Crunchyroll expo as well so yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i'm assuming anime fest Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's, it's definitely, um, you know, it's become a huge thing. Um, and I think that's great because the attitude for a while was like, oh, well, you know, if you're going to dress up, like, you have to expect certain things. Yeah. Um, and I think what you said is true. Like, the, Lauren and I talked about this a bit on the panel, but the idea that anime fandom is you know majority male and that anyone who's not a cis man just needs to kind of accept that that's mm -hmm. the way things are that's the price of admission that myth gets completely shattered as soon as you step into Coms a convention have been these at days. parody for years yeah or you know or majority not not cis men so it's it's a bit of a mistaken 
impression of conventions to think that that's the way they still are. Mm -hmm. As you say, I think they must have changed a great deal. Even within this, these three conventions that I went to, I thought something was quite interesting. So Otakon is the most established of the three, I think. Um, I think so. And that was probably, to my mind, the most conservative in terms of con- like feminist content. So I did, I did go to, you know, the women in anime panel and things like that. But it seemed like it was more, they just didn't include certain content that would have been anti-feminist, I guess. So there was no anti-feminist content and that was kind of as progressive as they got. And then at Anime Fest, it seemed that the fan panels were most progressive and it was amazing. They actually, I don't think Otakon had any fan panels that had the word feminist or feminism in the title or in the description. Whereas at Anime Fest, obviously, Caitlin, we had your Is This Feminist or Not right. panel, well, people, which was absolutely fantastic, by the way. I feel like people do tend to shy away from using the word feminist um, yeah. explicitly, even if it is um, feminist themes. Um, yeah, and, I mean, and I understand it. I've, I've, I've done, you know, I do it. I'm very carefully careful about applying the term feminism because I want it to. Have, I keep to a very narrow definition of it. So that's you know the. And that's so that's sort of why, but I also you know there's probably some people who see it as limiting as potentially limiting their audience or driving people away. I think there's people who are probably worried that panels are going to get turned down. I mm-hmm. mean, I've been worried on that basis. Obviously, we submitted a, our panel, which was a feminist survival guide to anime fandom. We submitted it to Otakon, and it got rejected for whatever reason. I will say that it must have been at the very last stage because we got yeah. very late notification of it. So they clearly were considering it. But it did get rejected. Like first, and I do wonder if the name had been different, would we have been I, accepted? I, I mean, sure. I think part of it has to do with the fact that um, everyone who was specifically listed for it was first time panelists. Because um, my um, Abuse and Shoujo panel got waitlisted last year. Well, Lauren was a Lauren was a listed was Lauren panelist a listed as well. Panelist. She's far from a first time panelist. I mean, we had on the list, we had... Uh, it was all of us, right? Mm-hmm. So it was uh, you, me, Lauren, Peter, and Vry and Dean. Yeah. And like we've all got, we've all got a background yeah. on the internet now. We've all got our own kind of followings to an extent. But I don't know if we can dismiss it and say, yeah, I mean, it's I because don't know. we were first it's, time panelists. It's impossible to really know exactly what happened. And that's that's the thing. But looking at Otakon as a whole, its programming as a whole. It does make me wonder because the other panels, even where they had feminist themes, even where they were clearly talking about something from a left wing perspective, let's say, they were not explicit about it. And I wonder if we toned down the language, which is not something I'm prepared to do, (laughs) by the way, if we had toned down the language, would we have increased our chances of being selected? So I understand why people choose not to use such a loaded word in their title front and center. And actually, it just makes me more impressed when conventions say, yes, we want that. Despite despite this word being front and center, we know what reaction it can evoke. And we all saw that in the weeks running up to our panel at Crunchyroll Expo. We, we had a one-star review for our panel an yeah. hour before it actually began, which was which was just amazing. And that's that's still the response that the word feminist in any kind of panel mm-hmm. is getting. Well, and I think um because I've seen feminism in anime panels that people have done in the past, and they uh, part of it set off a whole thing on tumblr um on tumblr on tumblr so yeah so okay so there were a lot of feminism and anime panels for a while and they were generally pretty basic um and one of them set someone off because it they were all like very very basic like this is unfeminist. This is feminist friendly. You know, these tropes are unfeminist. This, these tropes are feminist friendly. These tropes are feminist. And it was saying stuff like magical girl anime is inherently feminist. Um, you know, all female casts are inherently feminist. And like I said, um, feminism, I think, is a word that needs to be uh, that needs to be a- assigned to series sparingly. Um, so and. Um, a Japanese trans woman just went off on that post um, talking about like how like she's tired of 
uh, Americans um, assuming these things when the cultural context is different. Um, and um, so like for a while talking about feminism in anime sort of went out of vogue. I can understand that. That sounds like a really difficult it was. exchange. It was. Um, and like so like then like feminism and anime panels like kind of dried up and now I think it's more interesting is that um, people are looking more at specific topics but um, you know because you're talking about feminism and now anime you're not going to be able to do anything but the most shallow discussion in the time that you get for a panel um, so you know it's um, I think that might play a role in what happened not maybe not specifically about um our panel but i think that is probably a contributor to why people um don't necessarily assign that word to it um you know i think uh there's a lot of factors well something that i found very interesting again in this trio of cons um so i mentioned that otakon its programming was broadly more conservatively approached there were feminist themes in there but it was not kind of front and center in the descriptions that was not the kind of the point of appeal for people um when reading through the program there was anime fest which did have explicitly feminist programming um and then there was crunchyroll expo where the programming like was broadly progressive not just in the fan panels but also in the types of guests they invited how they framed the guest discussions i was really impressed by that I wasn't impressed by everything that Crunchyroll Expo did. I'm writing a con report about it where I'll go into more detail. But in terms of being a a convention kind of showing its values, like Crunchyroll, I thought, would, did a good job of putting progressive values in the very fabric of the convention. So examples, we had Johnny Weir as a big guest of honor. And, you know, Olympic figure skater, also queer icon. We had the Dream Daddy creators, or the creative team, which is a game that has built up a reputation for being particularly diverse and inclusive. We had a diversity in anime and manga panel that focused on black owned, black created companies um, producing anime and manga. We had, I mean, the fact that they had our panel there was, <laughs> was I think said something, um, but it was the official panels that really impressed me. The fact that Urahara was there and Urahara is a, an anime that's coming up on Crunchyroll soon. I think it's part Crunchyroll produced and the creative team is almost entirely women. So they had three women sitting in front of us talking about their professional lives in anime. And that is something that we just don't get a lot of at any convention. So that was really at the very core of Crunchyroll was this very... Crunchyroll Expo was this very progressive approach to a convention, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah. Um, well, and um, something that Otakon did have a lot of. Um, so Jamie McGonigal it was one of the guests, and I had a chance to sit down and um, interview him. And this isn't specifically um, a feminist thing, but, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it's a, a connected issue. So he's, he's not a huge voice actor, um, but he's, you know, he's gay and he's a big, um, really into uh, activism. Um, and I actually had to, I had a chance to sit down and interview him. And, he, um, you know, he was sort of talking about how he uses um, this as an opportunity to travel to conventions and to give people uh, a space to um, to meet and to connect and to talk, because for a lot of people, conventions they're not um, in in his words they're not a safe space, but they're a safer space. Um, you know, and this is sort of they're a place where um, people experience with you know. Um, gay teens and transgender teens and trans, I mean, transgender adults too. Um, they're a chance for them to be out for a weekend when they're not at home, you know, and this is something that I've seen in my own friends. It's not just about, you know, feminism, uh, that specific aspect of feminism, but like, um, people feel safer to 
be themselves in that way as well. Yeah, I was thoroughly impressed with that at all of the cons I went to, but particularly Otakon, you would see queer couples holding hands. You'd see either transgender people or just gender non-conforming people who were wearing kind of whatever they wanted. You know, you saw kind of fully grown male presenting people who were wearing cute clothes and makeup. It's like, yeah, absolutely. You should be able to feel comfortable doing this in the real world as well. But since that's mm-hmm. not an option right now, having any space where you can be yourself, do some things that make you feel comfortable, make you feel good about yourself, that's so important. And that's something that anime fandom does offer. Let's your experiment and see if this is a better fit. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's a space where it is okay to be like, how do I put this? A little bit i want to say a little bit uh yeah it's more, it's a less judgmental space um because like i was gonna say it's a space where it's okay to be a little bit weird but i don't want to say that like you know yeah but um it's a space where it's safe to be different and that's it's kind of challenge conventions a bit yeah it's it's really yeah, absolutely it's really cool that way i was really struck by that yeah, I, I think that it, it, conventions in general are a great thing to go to to kind of dispel any sort of, you know, there's like a lot of lines on social media about like what the fandom is like and what the industry is like. And just by being in a convention, I think you could see that that's not true. Um, Absolutely. For myself personally, I think this was one of the, this like year um, was like me for like going kind of as a self-identified feminist, like with that, like being a prominent aspect of it, but also like attending a lot of panels um, for different reasons as well. Um, so I, I, I don't know quite what I'm looking at it from which perspective, um, but I, I definitely see that, I mean, as we were saying, the gender composition uh, of uh, any of these conventions was like roughly 50-50, uh, if not leaning toward female, and I think that is probably very reflective of audience. Um, but also, uh, more on like the industry side, uh, I, one of, the way you get a lot of pushback in regards to like feminist criticism of anime is that the Western audiences aren't really an important consideration for Japanese companies. Um, But I can say, I think I attended, was it five uh, world premieres at American conventions this year? Yeah, no, it's not, that's, I mean, that's just straight up not true. Yeah, the fact the fact that they're what they want to screen their anime in America first before anywhere, before Japan. So I watched uh, Ancient Magus Bride, uh, Violet Evergarden, um, Cardcaptor Sakura, um, Anime Expo also had Welcome to the Ballroom, and then Otakon had uh, Eureka 7, uh, High Evolution. That was the first screening opportunities anybody in the world had to see those movies was in America, not Japan. So I, if, it, if they don't, if America is not part of a big part of their consideration and therefore American tastes, so they want to make stuff that the Western audience is going to consume if the Western audience is important to them. Uh, and then they're, they're screening these things in America before even their Japanese audience gets to see it. Yeah, there were a few panels at Crunchyroll Expo actually that directly addressed this this myth of anime as a hundred percent Japanese pure blood industry, and it's just not the case. Right. Like, I mean, obviously, like where you know Western audiences are sen- secondary, and so- and some creators don't care. Like, you know, the industry is not a sure. monolith. But that's the point, isn't it? The industry is not a monolith. Right. The on industry either side. is not a monolith. Some some creators care very deeply. And some creators don't care, but the people who are paying their bills do care. Right. Because they know they can make more money out of certain things abroad than in Japan. Right. And this is not a recent thing. Like, there was Miles ran a panel at Crunchyroll Expo, kind of looking at the long history of um, co-productions, international co-productions that are technically anime, but also, you know, you might think technically not anime. And this goes back absolutely decades. Yeah. It's from all... all all angles like on the industry side uh yeah the west has been co-producing anime for years years and years and also um they've been making anime specifically i mean it depends like some anime studios or creators specifically focus on the japanese audience um but like trigun i remember was very specifically uh and i think how as well was both were very targeted toward western audiences that was the idea um and uh more presently i think studio wit has a massive emphasis on their western audience like above and beyond like uh their japanese audience i think their focus is uh on the west because araki uh, he first did death note which was like huge in the west and now they've been focusing on other series that um have been very popular in the west to the point where i think that they're trying to identify what western tastes are and specifically cater to them that's why they made uh after 
um, Attack on Titan, they made Cabinary, uh, which was like more, even more Western because it had like American grindhouse elements. And I believe when they were discussing Ancient Magus Bride, uh, it's based in the UK, and they also and they knew the the manga was popular in the West as well. So it seemed like a good choice because it would likely be popular in the West. Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, one of the things that made up my mind on what to attend, uh, what panels to attend, and what screenings to attend, and so on, were does it challenge myths in some way? And that that was one of my criteria. Um, as a feminist going, I went as an Anafem representative, so I missed out on a few things that I would have really liked to go to because there were some really great sounding panels that were on at the same time and they were explicitly feminist and I just had to go to them. But I went to some of the, the kind of to my mind, the strongest panels at those times when I was like, well, I don't really know what to expect from it, but it says it's going to be talking about, for example, diversity in anime and manga. I went to a probably the most emotional response I had to a panel this month was at um, the Diversity in Anime and Manga panel in Crunchyroll Expo, because they had two companies up on stage as the panelists, uh, creators and producers from a company called Noir César and a company called Saturday AM. And these are people who grew up as giant anime nerds and they just never saw themselves represented on screen or very rarely and how often was it positive how many role models were there for them and this is something i as a woman of color completely identified with and it really choked me up listening to this panel of people talk about how they didn't see themselves represented they understood the power of seeing yourself represented and then they decided to make what they couldn't see so they now make anime and manga in the west with with people of color creating these stories and presenting them in a in a format and an aesthetic that they themselves have grown up loving. And that was so inspiring to me. Um, but what was really interesting about that was looking around the room. There were so many white people in the room who were all nodding and saying, yep, yeah, absolutely. And it just, it was a really strong example of how speaking about something like diversity in anime and manga, it's not niche. Like every one of those people, presumably, I can only imagine, had their own experiences where they saw themselves represented for the first time and it was meaningful to them. So maybe they saw their own queerness represented. Maybe they saw their own mental illness represented. Maybe they saw their disability represented. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be about race when we talk about diversity. Right. The fact is they had that experience and they identified with these black creators talking about an experience that they had technically never had but they had a close enough experience they could map onto it. This isn't a niche discussion. Yeah, like a silent voice. And that's Oh my goodness, yes, absolutely. And it was really powerful for me. I think that was the most powerful panel experience I had through the entire month. And I would not have gone to that because there was some, I think there was a Q&A with uh, Kore Yamazaki, the creator of the Ancient Maze Bride on at that time. And I decided against going to that. And it sounds like it was incredible. Oh. She did live drawing on stage. <laughs> but I'm so glad I was at the Diversity in Anime and Manga panel. And that is something that I only chose because I went there as a feminist looking for feminist related panels yeah um and another thing that like i've seen crop up more and more is um uh panels specifically related to uh diversity in cosplay as well um and like you know not like racial diversity uh body diversity gender diversity um i've seen a lot of that coming up um, which is great because, like, um, you know, I, I was pretty involved in the cosplay community for a few years um, in my teens. Um, but I haven't really been as much. But, like, I'm sure there's still plenty of people like that. But, like, people can get just absolutely, like, could get absolutely vicious um, about, you know, oh, well, you need, you you have to cosplay to your body type if you're you know, too big and you're cosplaying as this character, um, you're too old and you're cosplaying this, as this character, like, um, then, you know, you're, you're opening yourself up for this. Um, so like the fact that there are so many, like a ton of panels at conventions these days that are talking about this and promoting, um, cosplayers from different backgrounds, um, is a huge shift <laughs> just on the cosplay panel there was i went to one of those at anime fest i just want to say how impressed i was 
because it was called positive and su positivity and support in the cosplay community, I think. And I was thinking, okay, it's going to be it's going to be women leading the discussion, I thought. I walked in and it was these three kind of burly guys <laughs> and leading a discussion on mental health, on discrimination, on anxiety, on depression, talking very openly about their own experiences with all of these things and inviting the audience to do the same. And I was so impressed. I mean, I mentioned this in my com report, but the, the patriarchy hurts everybody is a line that we use often and rightly so and mental health and the stigma around talking about it is still something that is extremely relevant for men in particular. And to see men leading that discussion, like they submitted this panel, they volunteered to do this, they stood up as three men and said, this is a conversation we need to have. I was so impressed by that. And if this is something that has proliferated through the, the convention landscape, I'm very pleased about that. Um, so we've been talking a lot about sort of panels and, um... How, how that's shifted so like that sort of brings us to our next point um which is like sort of what the experience the best parts of the experience and congoing styles for you so because going to panels has always been really huge but um more and more for me also social networking so um how has that been for you guys i mean networking has been a huge part of my con experience what limited experience i have um but I, like i mentioned before i went to a convention and met andrew from anime limited and like ended up working his booth <laughs> <laughs> and ended up as a result meeting i met at the time people who worked at manga entertainment people who worked at adv films like these are big names in the uk guys and <laughs> who worked in the in these big companies who were kind of the people to know i remember a very starstruck dinner where I ended up sitting next to Brad Swale and I just wow. didn't know what to do. <laughs> oh my god. I was, he played Catra I was trying to play it cool. But I was like, you're Catra, Blink. you're Catra. Oh my god. I would have so, like died. <laughs> I almost did. I almost did. Um this is how I learned not to interview voice actors. <laughs> I get too starstruck. Um, but I remember that so clearly and then I dropped out of anime fandom as which is well documented for like ten years. And I have had to kind of, I now am in a position of kind of reconnecting with these people under quite different circumstances because I now run a website called AnimeFeminist.com. Um, and I'm not sure, based on discussions at the time, kind of how on board everyone I met then is with that concept. So I'll find that out, I guess. Um, but this time around, it was walking in with people knowing full well that I run a website called AnimeFeminist.com. And it was gratifying to me the welcome that we received mm -hmm. on that basis. Absolutely. And actually it was, there were three kind of levels, I guess. Each con was a very different experience for me. So the first week, um, that was my first con. It was Otacon, it was huge. I knew a few people, but probably my social and networking triumph was being invited to a room party with somebody that I'd never met before. And it was just off the back of be both of us being in a mm -hmm. panel and striking up conversation afterwards. Yeah, and, and like long time industry people. Yeah, so it was really, it was, it was good to see that that kind of, that is still an mm -hmm. option. Like you can just be an interesting person talking yeah. to an interesting person and end up making friends. And the great thing about conventions is that you can capitalize on that immediately. There are options to socialize with people immediately. And as it happens, that same person then attended our mixer two weeks later at Crunchyroll Expo, which was, it was great to be able to return the favor. So that was one experience. And then at Anime Fest, obviously you and I, Caitlin, and our room of other people, we hosted a room yeah, party. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And like, I mean, and another thing at Anime Fest was that, um, you know, uh, after I went to Susan Napier's panel, she's a huge name in like the, you know, anime academia. Um, yeah, I read her yeah, book years ago. Yeah, like, you know, and after her panel, I just walked up and I introduced myself and I like, you know, talked to her about my work and she came to my panels after that. And we got, you know, we got coffee one morning, like we walked over to Starbucks and, you know, like the fact that like, I can do that, like it's, it's incredible. Like I got to sit down and I mean, this is something that I could do because of press privileges, but like getting to sit down with Sayo Yamamoto was just like mind-blowing 
Like, it's it was incre- just absolutely incredible. But you say you had press privileges. I just want to break this down a little bit so people mm-hmm. understand what we're talking about here. Because when I first heard press pass, I was like, oh, that you have to be ANN. You have to be Crunchyroll. You have to be, I don't know, fan of the Anime Herald. It was... I assumed you had to be a big site. I assumed you had to be more of a news site. And that's just not the case. Right. We got press passes as Anime Feminist for Anime Fest. And uh, that had not even occurred to me until you said, hey, do you mind if I apply for this? And I was like, go ahead, Caitlin. You can give it a try if you want. And then they gave them to us. And actually, yeah, as long as you have a blog with decent readership and you're willing to write about your experiences. I mean, nobody's told us how we should write about anything. We've been putting up com reports without having to seek approval or anything like that. So that's it's more accessible to you than you might think. So if anyone is listening to this and thinking, well, it's okay for you, if that's the con experience that you want, create a blog, build it up. It is not shut off from you at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even more prominent blog. I don't think Wave Motion Cannon's been around that long, um, but they, they are... Um, just I think it's what is it three or four guys um, who have a unique perspective. They're very motivated and interested in the subject, and they like started their blog, got it together, and now they they have press access to most places. But yeah, there are people with individual blogs going. So I, I think uh, anime. Yeah, I mean, like, I've I've been doing Sakura Khan as heroin problem for a few years now. Yeah. Like Otakon had like a, I think a two year. Um, you have yeah. To, your site has to be around for two year requirement, but I think that's actually like a higher. Yeah, um, bar I've... than most conventions. Mm-hmm. I think. Uh, yes. If, if if you start up your own blog or join up with another blog, your your odds are of getting in with press access are, are pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's yeah. not like super exclusive. Uh, you have to be working out of some sort of big outlet for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It varies from con to con, but like if you do any sort of writing about anime at all, um, it's definitely worth looking into. Um, you know, there's one that's. Is it, Kurumikon? It's like Pacific Northwest area. I think it might be in Victoria, British Columbia, um, where it's like, you know, you have to update your site with a certain level of frequency. But like, and if you're like just, like just off from certain requirements, you know, try it anyway. Like I, the heroin problem's not two years old yet, but um, it's close. And I, you know, I went to Otakana's press for heroin problem. Um, you know, so like, it's definitely, it is, it is achievable if you're willing to put in some degree of work. And I want to just make it really clear to everyone that the things that we're talking about are accessible. I mean, when I say I went there representing anime feminist, actually a lot of people spoke to me before knowing who I was. And a lot of people by the end of the conversation still didn't know who I was. But getting access to these spaces very often was, well, to be honest, the English accent helped. Not going to lie. <laughs> pretty, sure that's, pretty sure that's how um, my room party invitation, I'm pretty sure that's how the conversation started with, oh, you're from London. It's like, well, yes, now we can have a conversation. But it could be anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were in a panel where, where the, the person who invited me actually asked a question. And I could have easily gone up to him afterwards and said, oh, the, you know, I really thought your question was interesting. Can we discuss that for a minute? And I think mm-hmm. he would have been open to that. Yeah. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. You just have to come across mm-hmm. like you're interested in them as human yeah. beings and what they have to say and not as starstruck celebrities right. around people like Brad Swale. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I mean, like, you know, I'm not going to say it's like you can just walk up to any old person and say any old thing and, like, they're instantly yes. going to be your bestest best friend. But, like, Absolutely. if you are someone who has something who's thoughtful and cares a lot um, and has an interesting perspective like that alone will open a lot of doors for you and there's also groundwork that you can lay yeah I mean, the final the final social experience that i had of this trip was obviously hosting our own official anime feminist mixer in collaboration with woke weebs and i i spoke to ali on twitter months ago ali uh, heads up woke weebs which is an organization i think they're based in la and they do social mixers regularly just for Feminist anime fans, effectively, it's exactly our target audience. And she hosts these things and she has experience hosting them. And so I said, oh, we'd kind of like to do a meetup, Ali. And she said, I'm on it. And she just took care of it, basically. Um, And 
she she reserved a space and we showed up and we showed up with a lot of people relatively speaking because i've spent most of the last year talking to people on twitter twitter is a hugely valuable networking tool i mean you end up in a twitter bubble where you feel like that represents the entire fandom and it doesn't and you need to be careful of that but it is an incredibly useful way to make contact with people in advance and also afterwards since attending these conventions i have had people contact me through twitter and build on a conversation that we had in person that lasted maybe two minutes. But because we have that two minute conversation, they've now come up to me on Twitter and said, hey, it was great talking to you. And they followed me, I followed them, and we have a new connection. And the next time I go to a convention they're at, maybe we'll get a drink together. That's how these things work. It takes a bit of time perhaps, but you can, you can have the kind of spontaneous, hey, do you wanna to come to my room party? We've had an interesting conversation. I'd like to continue that. But you can also have I'm going to be at this convention in six months. Let me speak to people I find interesting. Let me ask them in advance if they're going to be there and say if they'd like to meet up for a drink where I'll be. Yeah, I'd say it, another super gratifying thing for me was uh, I know a lot of people in the industry who are uh, self-described feminists, uh, but um, and I, I was expecting, you know, just from the way a lot of uh, other people who I knew I would be meeting spoke that they were I mean, they didn't like outright say I'm a feminist, but their viewpoints seem to be somewhat aligned. But I don't think I met a single person at any of the conventions who was like industry related or a guest or anything like that, who was at all, most of them just outright uh, claimed they were a feminist or uh, in conversations stating like uh, either hearing you say you were an anime feminist in proximity or my describing my work with them, it only made them more interested. Right. So yeah. it, it seems like like across the board, I think every single industry person I spoke with uh, was actually interested in this subject, uh, if not like already proactive about it themselves in some regard. Uh, and I, that was that was somewhat unexpected to me. Just like the fact I, I figured like one or two, you know, that there would be there would be people who would disagree, but that that wasn't my experience. It was it was literally everyone. There were a few people uh, at the Crunchyroll industry party who I didn't introduce myself to with in connection with the website because I didn't think it would go down well. Um, but that's not people that I would consider anime industry and it's not people that I would consider anime fandom specifically. Um, so I think I think that is broadly true though. I mean, you just have to look at the people who, who came along to our party and it was people across anime industry. It was people across anime fandom, people you might not necessarily expect to be totally keen to go to a feminist anime party on a Saturday night at a convention, but they showed up and they had a good time and they were there till the end of the night. And that just speaks to how much more accepted feminism now in the mainstream of anime fandom, which is broadly liberal, despite all the neo-Nazis with anime avatars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, I was pretty optimistic about that mixture, but it was pretty wild. The, the turnout we got and the, the people who showed up, mm -hmm. that was very, yeah. It was very validating. It really was. And now we're going to plan to do this at as many conventions as we can at Anime Feminist Meetup so people who are like-minded can join in one place and drink together and have a good time. I and mean, we don't need to be talking about feminism all the time. I don't think we spoke about feminism once at that party. But it was... it. I think it's uh, something. It is something that you can use as a tool now to make connections. Say that you have a feminist viewpoint on anime, and when people respond well, they will respond really well, and they will want to connect with you, and they will want to spend more time with you. And if they don't respond well, maybe you don't want to spend time with them. So it's certainly been a good litmus test for me to say I, I run AnimeFeminist.com and see how people respond. But as Peter said, it was overwhelmingly positive. Um, so we're running low on time, but I do want to quickly sort of talk about a couple of other things. Um, specifically two things that are sort of, um, have been integral to our convention experiences this year is, um, is panels and guests, specifically, uh, our panels and the guests that, uh, sort of, um, drew us to cons because I think at least with Anime Fest this year it was um uh unusually uh major draw um so we all did we all participated in panels I believe Peter did you work were you involved in any panels this year I did not I don't think no. you were this no, year not okay. at Otakon and I at Crunchyroll Expo I was working the actual convention so okay no 
Yeah, so, okay. So, never mind. We did not all do panels this year, but Amelia <laughs> and I both did. Um, we did. Yeah. My first yeah. panel. Yeah. Um, so, sort of, like, you know, talk about the experience of putting together panels. Um, okay, I'm laughing because I had several sleepless nights leading up to the panel just putting it together because there was so much going mm-hmm. on and I was specifically there to network and to gather content for Anafem. So I spent as much of my day as possible in convention programming and then I spent as much of my evenings as possible meeting people that I wanted to meet and spending time with them. And sometimes they went on very late. So for Crunchyroll Expo, you know, I'd spent the week um doing things like visiting the Crunchyroll offices. I visited Viz. In the evening, I was spending time with people that I knew in the San Francisco area. And it was <laughs> it was really busy and it was really fun. And I didn't, I didn't have a block of time. I really wanted like an afternoon when I could just sit down and work on the panel. And it didn't really happen because I was doing too much other good stuff. So I got to Crunchyroll Expo and that first night I stayed up no, it was Friday night, I think I, um, no, Thursday night, okay, so Thursday night, I stayed up until I think 4am working on a panel, and then I got like an hour's sleep, and then I woke up and did more, it was a really long night, and then the second night, I'm glad I did though, because on the the Friday night, I went to a a party, and we stayed out until 5am, yeah (laughs) so I didn't get anything done then either so then I woke up at like Lauren woke me up I think seven eight o'clock and was like we should really run through our panel I was like you're so right but I'm exhausted and then we ran through our panel but we did pull it together and actually when we actually got in the room and I was somewhat hungover I was absolutely shattered from several nights in a row with basically no sleep but we just started talking and because we knew our subject matter so well, it was a feminist survival guide to anime fandom. We both got stories. We were able to just bounce off each other. And I mean, the time running through it was invaluable, but actually more important was that we had focus and we knew exactly where, what we needed to cover in each section. And we like either of us could have covered either section, I think. Um, And there were some times when I think our back and forth was a little bit awkward because Lauren expected me to cover something that I thought she was covering. (laughs) Actually, both of us could have done it, but we didn't want to tread on each other's toes. But I think that was the worst uh, scenario for it. And I think the biggest frustration that I had with panels that I went to was when they were unfocused and they were just chit chat. And I, I want to go to a panel to learn something or to gain some kind of insight. And if the only insight I get is you're really charming and I'd love to drink with you, then that's not that's not good enough that's not a good enough hour of my time i agree i agree like i i go to fan panels are probably the biggest thing for me at cons and i go to them because i think it sounds like there's um you know something interesting for me to learn and that's you know sort of always what i aim to impart at the panels that i put on myself one aim that we had was that the slides be so useful that people want to see them afterwards and we've had multiple requests for our slides since then and that kind of makes me feel like we did our job we Mm -hmm. provided information people want yeah um like the um and and i was laughing at your story too because like one of my panels that i think has gotten the strongest response well no okay so the panels that have gotten the strongest response is the abuse in shoujo like um most even like i even though the slides have been up for uh, over a year, um, like close to a year and a half, um, those articles are still regularly um, the top the top hits on heroin problem. So that's been huge. Um, but like my um, panel, is this feminist or not? Got a pretty ha- has gotten a pretty strong response, and literally. I made that presentation the morning of. I spent weeks and weeks agonizing, not sure, like no idea what the um, format was going to be. And then I woke up that morning. I was like, okay, I really have to do this now. And I sat down and I put it together and... It came out really well. And it's great. Uh, I got a chance to see that panel in action and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I feel like it was a really, like you say, an educational experience. I highly recommend people look up the slides. Um, And like, you know, I ran into a girl who went to it the first time I presented it at SakuraCon and she said that it 
like changed the way that she looked at media. You know, I've gotten a lot of people complimenting me saying it's a lot like there's they say it's a lot more moderate than a lot of similar panels, which I I, I, I take it as a compliment because my I'm goal is... I'm a little is, bit suspicious of that phrasing, uh, and so I'm sure like, you yeah, are too. Well, <laughs> uh, or like, you know, measured or like even-handed. Um, yeah. Basically like, I mean, the way I think of it is that um, I'm, I'm fine with it because my goal in that, like I said, my goal in that panel is not to um, tell people what is or is not feminist. It is to challenge people to think uh to um and provide a framework t for um how to sort of think about it if this is something that interests you and to draw their own conclusions um, that was hilarious by the way caitlin spends 45 minutes explaining in great detail with examples all the way of why is this feminist or not is not a useful question and there are better questions we should be asking then you have 15 minutes of Q&A, about half of which is people saying, okay, but is Kill the Kill feminist? Okay, but is Fushigi Yugi feminist? Is whatever feminist? And people still want those answers, even after you've mm -hmm. gone into great detail. Yeah, and I mean, I don't want to just sit there and be like, well, what do you think? <laughs> um, but like, yeah, I mean, yeah, that that has happened both times I've done that panel. I'm, sure <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. People um, love categories, and I include myself in that. I completely understand the 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 wish to want to figure out if what you're watching is going to be problematic or not. But the content of your panel is excellent in breaking down why there are better approaches to it. Yeah, and so like that's sort of um, what I you know I like to do with panels is to teach people about things. Um, and when I go to panels, I want to learn about things and. You know, and people have always responded really well. Um, you know, when I one year when I did my abuse in shoujo one, um, there were a couple of like twelve year old girls sitting in the audience. I was just sitting there like, oh my gosh, guys! Like I didn't actually say or directly address them as like, just I hope you like absorb this, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. You want to feel mm -hmm. like you're having a positive impact on your community mm -hmm. and yeah. that was a really gratifying thing for our feminist survival guide panel where we stepped out afterwards and we were surrounded by people who wanted to talk to us there was one mm -hmm. person who'd bought a day pass specifically to attend our panel yeah. and there were people who said we've been following your work there were people who said we've never heard of you before but mm -hmm. now i really love your advice on this that or the other and mm -hmm. we made some good connections with people and yeah actually running a panel is in itself a really good way to mm -hmm. network it is and it's you know it's like i said you know that sort of opened up um by like getting to hang out with susan napier and it's also like it's such a different connection from like uh having a blog because like you know when I post on heroin problem, I sit there and I watch the numbers go up and sometimes uh, people will comment and I respond to that. And But like actually seeing an audience of people listening to you and then at the end, like there's always someone who wants to come up and like talk with you about it. Um, it's just, it's such a like incredible experience. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and fan panel culture is definitely something that is um, unique to anime conventions. Like, um, oh really? Of, yeah. Oh yeah. Like um, other uh, conventions, like comic conventions and video game conventions. Um, is it all guests? They tend to be more, yeah, more industry driven, more guest driven. But mm. um, so guests usually aren't a super high priority for me at cons, um, mostly because I don't care so much what men have to say <laughs> but uh, there were plenty of female guests yeah in well, i attended this well, month i was really yeah. impressed by that um otakon i thought like was pretty lacking um i didn't end up interviewing any japanese guests i interviewed um stephanie she and jamie mcgonagall um mm -hmm. and that was really cool but like otakon or anime fest had like an incredible um guest lineup um I mean, just not just like the Yuri on Ice people, but like Science Saru, um, Un Young Choi, um, and they Arina had Tanaka. 
Yeah, they had, like, they had a Studio Ghibli animator. Like that's amazing. Yeah, like it was, um, the like the guest lineups this year was really cool. And once again, going back to being press, um, having the opportunity to like sit down, um, and interview them is really cool. It, it's I mean like one like I said, guys, if you want to get a press pass to a convention someday there are ways to do it you just have to put in the hustle and you have to earn it but you you absolutely can do it well something otakon did really well as well was that i think they made their guests really accessible yeah like uh mariyama and uh masabara hosted a panel after in this corner of the world mm-hmm. basically discussing the movie which just sort of became an open forum for people to talk about it uh and although i thought uh that tomoki kyoto had his own like focus panel for high evolution although i thought that one was a bit weird because it was before the movie came out so there wasn't as much to talk about since nobody had seen it yet. Yeah, um, a lot of times those will just be like promotional, and a lot, of, and a lot of um, Japanese guests come to cons sort of to to promote properties. Like they don't just come to meet the fans and be accessible to the fans. They come like they are able to take time out of their busy schedule because there's something the studio wants to promote, which is why you'll see um, guests come like either before or after a really big property is going to come out, like uh, Blood Blockade Battlefront was new. We got Rie Matsumoto at Sakura Con, which is pretty cool. Um, but, like, yeah, so, like, um, Japanese guests a lot of the time are not a huge draw at conventions because conventions are not very generally very good at saying this person worked on this, 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 like yeah. all these properties that you care about. So they just see this name or they don't like, you know, it's an animation director. People don't know how huge of a role animation directors are have. So they skip those. But like this year, Anime Fest had a lot of guests that were really important to me. Yeah, I think Anime Fest did, of the, of the trio I went to, Anime Fest did the best from my perspective in pulling together a roster of guests who were kind of, fairly it seemed like fairly evenly divided between prestigious men and prestigious women um one point of interest from anime fest though for example i mean there was the women in anime panel which is i think was women in voice acting sorry panel and they mentioned there that there was a directors in voice acting panel which had no women on it so i there was an element perhaps of kind of maybe ticking a diversity checkbox by having this women in anime panel or women in voice acting panel, and they're not actually extending that to the the rest of the panels, which is, to be honest, something that I felt all of the conventions needed to work on. Yeah. There were a fair number of all-male panels, um, or kind of all-male guests of one type, for example. Like, that happened at, at all of the conventions to some extent or another. And that, that was a bit of a shame, but I can see how it's on the right lines, right. I guess. Um, and that sort of... Um... That was something that came up in a lot of my interviews and a lot of my interactions with guests is that people um, sort of talking because, you know, um, I'm interviewing for Anime Feminist. Um, Not all of my questions are going to be about what is it like being a woman working in anime? But, you know, that's going to sort of be like the theme is like how um, you perceive how they perceive women in anime and um you know, their experiences in the industry, right? Like, um, and a running theme with guests from both from the US and from Japan um, is that anime needs more female creative staff um, to create more authentic female characters. Um, You know, that came up with my interview with um, Stephanie Shea, that came up in my interview with Eunyoung Choi, that came up with my interview in... um, Sayo Yamamoto, um, Jamie McGonigal was talking about how there needs to be um, more authentic LGBTQ perspectives. Like, um, so, you know, uh, getting to meet guests um, and actual industry people can be really affirming because um, these are things that people have been telling me that no one actually in the industry cares about. Um, So that was really cool. Yeah, I think it's it's really important. I mean, this is a principle that Anime Feminist is based on as well, is that it's really important for people from a community to lead discussions about that community. So we see it as very important to provide a platform 
where people can discuss their own experiences with representation of their own communities. This unfortunately hasn't really spread through the uh, behind the scenes creative side of any media, I think. Um, you have to really go to independent media to see that kind of consistent representation. Um, but it was, it was nice to see some uh, female creatives represented, especially the Urahara panels at Crunchyroll Expo. I really appreciated seeing three professional women on stage at one time talking about their professional relationships, their professional contributions. And one thing they said that really struck me actually was that they, I think that the writer, had, she'd written, I think all, it was perhaps all 12 episodes of Urahara and went back and scrapped everything and started again because they felt that they hadn't infused it with the theme of creation enough. So these, the, the story of Uruhara, it's said in Harajuku, I believe, and it's everyone who's in the cast is a creator. And they felt that that didn't come across enough strongly in the dialogue. And I thought that was such a strong decision. And I questioned whether it would have come about had it been an all male writing team, right. had it been an all male creative team. Because frankly, that kind of decision that immediately guarantees agency. It immediately guarantees non-romantic motivations. So that's going to come through in the characters more strongly. And I question whether an all-male creative staff would have made that decision to scrap 12 episodes of, of writing in order to start again, in order to connect these women more strongly with a theme like that. Yeah. Um, so we should work way over. We should probably wrap this up. So just really quickly. What does the future of con going hold for you guys well for me i'm uh, i've just had it confirmed i'm going to be running our panel a feminist survival guide to anime fandom at first year convention hibanacon which is taking place in milton Keynes. sorry guys it's taking place in milton Keynes in uh, november and i'm i'm very interested by this i got a response back within 24 hours confirming the the panel's acceptance and that has made such a good impression on me so i'm really looking forward to this i know one person going i <laughs> i don't know anyone in uk fandom so if any of our readers or listeners are actually going to this please let me know so i have some friends there i don't have anywhere near the network that i have <laughs> in the us um so i'm trying to build up that community for myself here now before that i'm going to be at scotland loves anime in october that's more of a film mm -hmm. festival um, but yeah, say hi to me there as well, please. And then next year, we're looking at taking NFM to Sakura Con. It's a big con, yeah. I understand. And you, I, I saw so many photos last year and I, or this year, this year, and I was so jealous the entire time. And so I've decided I want some of that. <laughs> so I'm planning to book tickets and head out there and hopefully we can get a few more NFM team. Uh, in a room and maybe do a panel there as well and maybe have another party because the first one was very successful yeah um peter what is the uh what is your con going future look like um well i pretty much go to expo every year now and fanime is probably one of my favorite conventions because i know a lot of people who go there it's really chill like fan run uh convention that i really highly recommend uh to anybody although it's more local so make it if you can i guess uh uh, Otakon was great, so I'd like to go back there and see if, uh, I think they're going to continue running it out of DC, if that really works out. Um, if Anime Fest has a similar lineup to this year, next year, I'd definitely be interested in going. Um, because, the, I mean, they, they had a really good lineup of guests. Uh, uh, I'll probably be working Crunchyroll Expo again. Um, and I've been to SakuraCon once as industry... Um, but I would really like to attend as a fan, especially after seeing how many people went uh, this year. Um, it seems like a really cool convention to go to. So I guess I'll be going back to all the ones that I did this year, next year, and hopefully I'll be adding Anime Fest and Sakura Con to that list. <laughs> <laughs> Conventions are a very expensive hobby, yes, especially when you live in England. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I will be doing... I have one more convention this year. Um... I will be doing my uh, Romance and Abuse in Shoujo manga panel at uh, Geek Girl Con, uh, which is at the end of this month. Um, it's a more general purpose um, nerd culture uh, convention. It actually has kind of a smaller anime presence. Um, 
but it's really cool. It's all, it's very much about, um, inclusivity and acceptance, uh, within fandom. Um, so that's a, sort of, I think that's going to round out the year for me and the next year, um, you know, I'm local. I'm going to be at soccer con barring something major happening. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll try to go to Otakon. I don't know about Anime Fest because honestly this year the big draw for me was guests and if they don't get, um, you know, it would be hard to make an equal or better roster for me. Um, you know, and if it's not something that's, you know, it's not, if it's not a group of people that are going to like grab me super hard like this year, like I'm not going to trek out to Dallas for that. Um, so I probably won't, you know, it was a perfectly fine convention, just not, you know, enough to keep me coming back. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what I'm looking at next year. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I have any, you know, think about if I have any new panel ideas, um, cause you know, I don't want to keep doing the same one year after year. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, um. Hopefully we'll get to meet more people next year. Um, and this year's con season was intense. It was a lot of, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It, yeah, it was very intense. <laughs> three cons in three weeks. Actually, if you're doing nothing else, I highly recommend it. I had a great time. It started to feel like my job. And then I came home and had to do my actual job and it was a big downer. So I didn't <laughs> recommend that bit. Um, I will just say that we're going to have the slides from our panel available. We are going to put them up for you with, with slight editing to correct some of the stuff we noticed afterwards and also to trim out certain things. Um, and we're going to make the, the survival guide as a whole into more of a feature. We are going to make sure that everyone on the team is involved, not just me at 4am and Laura on the morning of. <laughs> and we're going to make it into a proper resource that people can actually use. So please look forward to that. Um, I'd just like to thank Caitlin for bringing up the idea of doing a podcast about this topic. It really has been a nice way to kind of close off what has been kind of a month of convention obsession for me. And then a lot of months beforehand, I booked my tickets back in February. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. And when you put it all together, yeah, we did actually learn a lot, cover a lot of ground. We've got a lot of experience on the team that I intend to tap into so that we can make more use of conventions as a resource going forward for Anime Feminist and for our community. Yeah. So speaking of which, you can find us on www.animefeminist.com. You can find us on Twitter at, at Anime Feminist. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash anime fem. Um, you can find us on Tumblr, animefeminist.tumblr.com. And we do have a Patreon, which covers 100% of our funding, which is patreon.com slash anime feminist. Now we have a good number of patrons. We have more funding than most people. We still need more. We want to pay everyone fairly for their work. That is a core principle of Anime Feminist. So we do appreciate, of course, the higher rollers, the $20 plus patrons, but at the same time, $1 patrons are our bread and butter. That gives us huge stability. It's massively appreciated. It really does add up. And if you give us $5 a month, then you get access to our private Anafem Discord, which is where we're building up a space for like-minded fans to be able to discuss amongst themselves as we as a team have been communicating privately for the past year. So thank you so much to Peter and Caitlin for joining me today to discuss this very interesting topic. And we will be back next time, I believe, with more, uh, more of a watch-along on a different series. 